We welcome all of our new online listeners. Hi, my name is Dr. Stephen Finney, the hosting pastor of XL Church in IOM America. My wife Jane and I are blessed that you decided to join us. XL represents Exchange Life. Our church is an outreach of IOM America. Everything we do sits upon the pedestal of compassion. So let's get started. Enjoy the worship, illustrative videos, prayer, and weekly message.
Psalm 22 verse 3 promises that God will be enthroned in the praises of His people. Your steadfast love extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness, it reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like majestic mountains. And your Hey friends, I wanted to uh, let you know how blessed I was uh, by all the really thousands of comments I got. Uh, last week I sent out a post, what are you thankful for? And you know, you think about times like this, is this a time that we're supposed to be thankful? And the answer to that is, is yes. Uh, the, the Bible says to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So there it is, uh, Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. So we, we bring our prayers uh, and our petitions to the Lord, but we bring them with thanksgiving in our hearts, uh, with a thankful heart. So Lord, we choose to do that today. We come before you with a thankful heart, thanking you for all you've done 
And by faith, we thank you for all you're about to do. Pray for my friends, all those who just uh, took the time to write and share their thoughts on Thanksgiving, letting me know what they're thankful for. Let's pray that you would meet all their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And today we come before you with a thankful heart and a song of praise. Amen. We are on a journey, a journey through the book of Revelation. Our main theme is unfolding the power of prophecy. One of the key things we need to keep in mind here is that the book of Revelation is not a book of prophecies. It is prophecies that you've been given since the first day of man being fulfilled. We're honored that you decided to join us. We certainly expect you to be challenged and blessed. Most Christians today avoid the study of this book. There's probably good reasons to that because of the supposed symbols that are within this book. We need to take special care of those symbols because those symbols are communicating exact truth about the book of Revelation. As for our little fellowship, the Lord has blessed us with a deep understanding of his prophecies. I personally have been studying them for over 30 years. We pray that all who listen today will be motivated to study his final words to the seven churches. number 36 in our 220 Revelation series. Thank you for joining us. We're on part number two of a three-part series on the Bereshit prophecies. We are looking at Revelation through the pictorial Hebrew. For those of you who are new to pictorial Hebrew versus modern Hebrew, the very first language that the Lord God gave us was through pictures. The Hebrew language itself was developed from these early pictures that God used to communicate with his people. Every language under the sun evolved from this pictorial Hebrew language. Those of us who have taken the time to learn and understand pictorial Hebrew, there's no other better way to say it than it has given us a clear picture of the authentic translations of the Old and New Testament. I have always said that there is Hebrew and Greek clearly stated in the book of Revelation. When I study this book, I study it from a pictorial Hebrew perspective, then I look at the Greek, and then into the English. It gives us God's picture of what he is communicating to his people. The Bereshit prophecy is from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 all the way to the book of Revelation, the last chapter and the last verse. The interesting note here is the Bereshit prophecy was clearly given to God's people in the beginning. That is why it is important for us to include this in our study of the book of Revelation. And even though you might not have a passion to study pictorial Hebrew, we need to give you an overview of how significant and how important it is to our study. The primary passage that we are teaching from as we explain the Bereshit prophecy is that of Isaiah 46 verses 9 through 11. It says, Remember the former things long past, for I am God. 
there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end of the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken, and truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. I do not consider myself an expert with the pictorial Hebrew, it's just a great love of mine. But there's a gentleman, C.J. Lovick, who has a gift from God to explain not only the Bereshit prophecy, but the language of pictorial Hebrew. So throughout this lesson, we're going to allow C.J. just to explain it in his very unique way of deducting pictorial Hebrew so that we can understand it in our times of today. I think you'll find it fascinating. The answer can be found in the Hebrew letter Sheen, the fourth Hebrew letter in Bereshit. The letter Sheen, as we learned, signifies pressing, gnashing, and destruction. Sheen is also the number 300. The number 300, Sheen, is used in connection with Enoch, Noah, Gideon, Samson, David, and Jesus to signify a supernatural victory over death. To discover more about Sheen, the number 300, we invite you to visit PassoverProphecy.com. Sheen is also the one number that is a shorthand signature of God's name, a name that signifies divine ownership. Take a look at the letter Sheen as it looks today in modern Hebrew. A picture is worth a thousand words. In 2 Chronicles 6, 6a, we read, But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. In 2 Chronicles 33, 7, we read, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Notice below that all three valleys that form the three fingers of Sheen all begin at Mount Moriah, the very spot where the Messiah offered himself up for the sins of man, the very spot where God said he would write his name. I have included an ancient map of Jerusalem. Notice that there are three valleys that come together at the base of Mount Moriah. The Kidron Valley on the right, the Central Valley in the middle, and the Hinnon Valley on the left. So in summary, the answer is yes. The Bereshit Passover prophecy reveals the very spot that God ordained in heaven in order to accomplish his grand purpose to redeem fallen man. Mount Moriah, the place Christians call Calvary, marks the spot where the Bereshit prophecy would take place. The final answer is, when will this happen? Does the Bereshit prophecy reveal when the epic event on Mount Moriah would take place? If so, where would we look for this clue? There is a time stamp found in the Yod and the Tob, the last two Hebrew numbers revealed in Bereshit, and those time stamps give us the answer. The two letters and numbers directly connect the sign of the wooden cross with the revelation that this sign is going to manifest itself at exactly the right time, a time appointed in heaven before the foundation of the earth. The same two letters or pictograms that revealed why the Son of God was coming out of his home in glory also literally reveal the ultimate sign of the times. The same two pictograms that combine the idea of a plan ordained in heaven, that's going to unfold on the earth at the appointed time, points us to the picture of the covenant and the sign of the wooden cross. The number Yod, or 10, is the key that unlocks the mystery of when this is all going to take place. Yod is God's divine multiplier. Yod often reveals that events will unfold on earth at the time appointed in heaven. The Bereshit timestamp prophecy is very simple to understand and needs little explanation. The Tav and the Yod provide the answer. 400 times 10 equals exactly 4,000. 4,000 years. 
Before we continue, I need to address the question of dating the death of Jesus. This is a topic that's been debated for the last 100 years. Tradition in today's church teaches that Jesus died in the year 33 A.D. Many of the early 1st and 2nd century church fathers taught that Jesus died in 30 A.D., a belief that exists among most biblical literalists to this very day. Others believe that Jesus died on one of the two dates in between 30 A.D. and 33 A.D. For the purpose of revealing the Bereshit prophecy, we have chosen to use the year 30 A.D. It is our conviction that this date is the most harmonious with the literal biblical account. But please understand that irrespective of the date, the year, used, it does not change the revelation in the Bereshit prophecy or invalidate its time prophecies in any way. It only slightly shifts the time frame. Let's go back to the Yod and the Tav that gives us the first prophetic time frame marker in the Bereshit prophecy. A prophetic time stamp of 4,000 years. Keep in mind that we are looking at the Bereshit prophecy through the lens of the end times prophetic perspective that is based on the belief that God has communicated in both pattern and type and by direct revelation that he has allotted 7,000 years for mankind on this present earth. This perspective is called the Millennial Day or Sabbath Millennial Day or Day for a Thousand Year Perspective. This method of calculating the unfolding of time, whatever name you prefer to call it, is the oldest prophetic biblical perspective on the earth. The concept is very simple and easy to grasp. God gave mankind from the very beginning a seven literal day repeating cycle. God then revealed that from his perspective, that each literal creation day was a thousand years and a thousand years as one day from his divine vantage point. Leaving us in no doubt as to what he had in mind, he further revealed in his word the importance of the number seven. Throughout the Bible, the number seven, considered a sacred number, demonstrated one thing, divine completion. The basic concept is that God has given man 6,000 years to work. That work will cease at the end of 6,000 years to be followed by 1,000 years of rest. So in a nutshell, the 7,000-year millennial perspective believes that the age of mankind, started with the year of creation, unfolds for 6,000 years of labor and ends with the 7,000th year of rest. So now the question is, does the Bereshit Yod Tov prophecy reveal the precise year when the crucifixion of Jesus would take place? Are there exactly 4,000 years between creation and the cross of Calvary? If you believe in the millennial day for a thousand year perspective, you might say yes. The time prophecy is close enough. After all, if Jesus died on the cross in 30 AD, and the prophecy predicts that the cross event is going to happen 4,000 years starting from the creation date of approximately 4,004 B.C., well then, that's close enough. The problem is that when you do the math starting with the creation date of 4,004 and going forward 4,000 years, you're left with an extra 33 or so years. For some, that is close enough, but for those that take God's word literally, it's a real problem. With the perspective that missing the mark by only 33 years is close enough, it would be impossible to predict the future events on God's millennial calendar with any precision since a thousand years is no longer a literal time span but simply a rough estimate. Is there evidence in the Bible based on prophetic times revealed as harbingers of future events that would warrant this sort of variation and imprecision when it comes to God's revelation regarding when something is going to take place. In other words, when God says a thousand years, can we take him seriously and literally? Or are we to take it just as an approximation? So let's ask the question again. Does the Bereshit Yod Tov timestamp prophecy reveal the exact precise year when the crucifixion of Jesus would take place starting from the 4004 BC year of creation and going forward 4,000 years? The answer is no. Now let's look at this from another perspective. Let's consider that God, in his great wisdom, did not provide us the exact year of the crucifixion, starting with the countdown from creation. Instead, 
God provided us with something much more amazing. God provided us with a measuring rod that reveals time in 1,000-year increments, a millennial view that is designed to take us right back to the first chapter of Genesis, where we're meant to consider again the meaning of the six days of creation, six days of labor followed by the seventh day of rest. Do you see the prophetic pattern that forecasts a millennial reign of Messiah in every cycle of the six days of creation followed by the seventh day of rest? Notice the weekly pattern that God designed to repeat hundreds of thousands of times as both a rehearsal and a prophetic harbinger that heralds the final seventh day. Is this a foreshadowing of the 1,000-year millennial reign of God's Son on the earth? Of course it is, and it's pretty hard to miss. God has provided us a millennial time span that is complementary and consistent with the six days for a thousand-year pattern God set forth as a pattern in Genesis chapter 1. Consider the one day with the Lord is as a thousand-year revelation that is revealed in both the Old and the New Testament, a divine perspective that is ultimately confirmed by the Lord Jesus himself who reveals six times in the book of Revelation, the exact time period of his seventh day upcoming kingly reign on the earth. The seventh day, the final day, that will last exactly 1,000 years. If the seventh day is exactly 1,000 years, then the other six days must also be precisely 1,000 years each. Six days equals exactly 6,000 years. This is the foundational numeric concept that fueled the Sabbath millennial end times perspective that is the oldest eschatology in the world. This is the prophetic view that was held by both the ancient Jewish rabbis and the early church fathers. The millennial perspective is now out of favor with biblical literalists because it seems to have failed. Many Christians who believe that the millennial day for a thousand-year perspective calculated from the start date of creation in 4004 B.C. would climax in the second coming of Christ in the years leading up to the year 2000 A.D. When that didn't happen, many Christians lost confidence in the accuracy of the millennial day for a thousand-year perspective. It seems that the millennial time clock is not as precise as some had imagined. Obviously, God has not failed, so perhaps the day for a thousand years is after all just an approximation and not to be taken literally. Should we just admit that the day for a thousand year millennial perspective failed, or has man failed to understand it from God's perspective? Let's take a look at this from another point of view. Let's take a fresh look at this asking two questions. When did the Son of God die on the cross, and why did the Son of God die on the cross? When did the sign of the Yod and the Tob, the last two letters in the Bereshit prophecy, take place? The unfolding of history has given us the answer. Christ died on Passover in 30 A.D. Why did the Savior hang on the cross of Calvary in 30 A.D.? He died to reverse the curse that Adam and all his descendants, including you and me, are now under. He died as an atonement for the sin and rebelliousness of Adam and all his descendants, including you and me. With the when and why fresh in your minds, let's look one more time at the 4,000-year timestamp measuring rod that allows us to look back in time, starting from the crucifixion of Christ on Passover in 30 A.D. But instead of going forward from the proposed date of creation, what happens when we look back in time 4,000 years from the cross of Calvary? Will we discover the millennial time stamp of 4,000 years is an approximation based on the start date of creation? Or will we discover the reason, precision, and majesty of this millennial prophetic time stamp from God's point of view? When we take this 4,000-year measuring rod and lay it on the timeline starting on Passover in 30 AD and go back in time 4,000 years, what event do we discover? We discover a date that no one has considered up until now. We discover a year whose monumental spiritual significance has been hidden for over 6,000 years. We discover the year 3970 B.C. 3970 B.C.? Why is this year important? Since 3970 B.C. is obviously not the date of creation based on biblical chronology, why is this date important? If we start at the cross on Passover in 30 A.D., 
and go back in time 4,000 years, it takes us to the year 3970. If we then start with the year 3970 and we go back in time another 33 and a half years, what date do we land on? The answer is the creation date of 4004 B.C. 4004 B.C. is the one date believed by students of biblical chronology to be the most reliable year to date the creation. Just to be perfectly clear, the creation date of 4004 is based on biblical chronology alone. Bishop Usher is not the only Bible scholar that believed that creation took place in 4004 B.C. Did you notice that I did not start this prophetic forecast from the starting point of creation in 4004 B.C. and go forward in time? No. I arrived at the 4004 date by taking the Bereshit Passover prophecy literally and then looking back in history 4,000 years and finally adding 33 and a half years to the equation. Now, if you're wondering why I added 33 and a half years to the 4,000-year forecast, here's the reason. We are glad that you joined us today. We understand that studying the book of Revelation is a challenge. We also want you to remember that it is impossible for you to comprehend the deep truths stated in the book of Revelation unless you have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit living inside you. If you're an unbeliever, a non-Christian listening to these particular messages, at some point in time, you're gonna have to make a decision to either refute Christ or to accept him. In the PDF of this particular message, in most of our messages, we have a salvation prayer at the bottom of that PDF. Please keep that in mind. Again, thank you for joining us. We look forward to reconnecting with you in our next message. Until next time.